too long. I just want to emphasize that I'm going to be talking more about the inequality aspect of, of the neoliberal diet. So uh, here's a short uh, outline. I'll start with the definition of the neoliberal diet, uh, uh, whether food is a matter of choice. Uh, I guess I'm going to argue against that, at least for a majority of the population who are subject to these two fundamental types of inequality that I call interstate inequality and class inequalities within each nation state, and then some conclusions. So what is the neoliberal diet? As you've seen, it's the globalized version of the industrial diet. It emerged in the United States in the 1940s. Uh, it is made up uh, mostly of energy dense ultra processed foods. And yet there are also what you might call luxury foods and basic foods. By those designations, I don't necessarily imply whether one or the other is more or less nutritious. What I refer to basically is uh, whether they are accessible or not. Luxury foods are less accessible. Some of them may be healthy, like fruits and vegetables. Others, not so much, like meat. Uh, and so basic foods, uh, I guess if you go back about 40 years in Mexico and look at the traditional basic foods in Mexico, you might say, well, those are pretty healthy. Uh, but there's been all these shifts in, in the diet in Mexico so that people have less access to uh, you know, that traditional diet, which included uh, you know, heavy doses of uh, fruit and vegetables. And, and part of the reason why it's become less accessible is because, well, Mexico became inserted in North America and a lot of the fruit and vegetables produced in Mexico are now exported. And so from the producer's point of view, it's a lot more attractive to export uh, the food than to sell in the domestic market. And I mean, this is a petrochemical use intensive kind of diet. So uh, one thing that I noticed in the mainstream literature uh, on uh, nutrition and food studies is uh, the assumption of even the critical uh, writers uh, uh, like uh, Michael Pollan or uh, um, uh, this woman, uh, Nestle, what's her name? Marion, Ma Marion Nestle. Marion uh, you know, they, they argue for voting with your fork uh, or eating for change as if, you know, eating were entirely uh, a matter of choice. And what I argue is that inequality limits consumer choice. And now, uh, let me make this qualification. Perhaps everybody in this class does actually have a choice. That's the bad news. <laughs> you are more or less responsible because most of you probably do have access to the healthy parts of, of food. So, but the question is, for a majority population, particularly the you know, lower middle, middle income people, maybe they don't have the same kind of choice that, that you do. Now, you, even with the higher economic access, uh, to the extent that uh, junk food is pretty tasty and addictive, you may be really tempted to going that route. So let me move on to the third major theme here, uh, interstate uh, class inequality. So um, let me just mention briefly, what was the debate in the early 1990s uh, with Mexico, Canada, the United States joining into the North American uh, uh, free trade agreement? Uh, the question was, is there going to be an upward convergence from Mexico toward North American levels, or perhaps a downward convergence. Um, uh, 
or maybe a divergence. And so these are the data that I'm going to show you. Um, so, I mean, to start with, in terms of uh, per capita gross domestic product, there hasn't been a convergence except between Canada and the United States. They started out the period in a very similar situation. They ended up the period also in a similar situation with the US slightly going up, Canada, you know, kind of flattening. But Mexico's uh, curve is flat, you know, since uh, 1970 until 2019. And these data are from the US uh, Federal Reserve economic data. And by the way, these are all data that are deflated to dollars from 2010. Uh, so I guess that's what I mean by interstate inequality. However, these are all um, averages, per capita average gross domestic product. So we need to break this down uh, by class. And so this chart lets us see what was the labor share of the gross domestic product when we equaled 1994 to 100. So this is an index uh, uh, around this time. I mean, that's when countries start at, at that point. And notice that before 94, there's no data for Mexico. It's just, you know, for Canada and the US. Uh, but what we can see is that there was uh, a few years during the Clinton administration where U.S. workers were actually uh, doing better off than they were in 1994. But after 2002, already into the Bush uh, era, uh, their share of income declined. And, you know, by the last uh, number of years, all workers are doing worse than they were doing in 1994 in terms of the share of the gross domestic product. So what this tells you is that, uh, I mean, all these average upward growth from Canada and the United States, it's not distributed equally uh, between capital and labor. I mean, the, the uh, you know, the, the rest of, of this income is obviously made by capital. So let me turn to food performance in North America. You know, what, what have countries been doing like? And I'm comparing the three NAFTA countries, uh, the US in blue, Canada in red, Mexico in green, you know, because some of those are some of the main colors in their flags and yellow is the world average. And this is kilocalories per capita per day. You might remember, I think this chart is, is in the book. So uh, couple, a couple of very notable uh, pieces of information here is that Mexico, during the time that it pursued a food sovereignty program, it surpassed Canada on a per capita kilocalories uh, per day basis, and it almost reached the level of the United States. Come the uh, foreign uh, indebtedness crisis, Mexico declares moratorium on the payments of its foreign debt, and things go kind of down to hell. Uh, and from then on, you know, Mexico's food performance becomes pretty flat. Um, so Canada here, you know, has a considerable decrease. It starts to approach the United States and then it flattens out as well. Here we notice a considerable decline uh, after the, <clears throat> particularly the, the financial crisis, Americans on average are not eating as much. But here's a, a very interesting question. How come, you know, with Mexico's per capita food ingestion flattened, why is Mexico the second most obese country in the world? You know, that, that's pretty puzzling. And I would say the answer has to do with 
the quality of food that Mexicans are accessing. What we have here is the percentage of proteins coming from vegetable products and how that evolved from 1961 to 2013, which is the last year for which we have data in the Food and Agriculture Organization database. And once again, here we're comparing with the world's average. So we notice here that you know Mexico was well above the world average in terms of uh, uh, consuming proteins from vegetable products. Canada and the US were very much down. And why is that? Well, because these are very meat eating countries, right? Uh, now, <clears throat> so Mexico declined a lot, you know, from nearly 75% uh, to just above uh, 55%. Uh, Canada, from the US and Canada, Canada is the one that increased the most in its consumption of vegetables. So in this sense, I guess, you know, you could say that Canada has fared the best in terms of uh, food performance with the association with Mexico. Uh, so, and as you can see, you know, the world, the world's average has also declined and that's because meat consumption in the world has increased quite a lot. That's, you know, what you might call the meatification of diets. So here uh, we have, um, I have this bar here from Zoom that, uh, doesn't let me see what I have here. Okay, uh, so the top eight food caloric sources, how did I derive this? Completely inductively. You know, I just went into the uh, database of uh, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and uh, downloaded, uh, you know, all the uh, contributions to food caloric sources from about a hundred uh, food products. And I just took the top eight. It's as simple as that. And so, and I did that for 1980 and 2013. And the question is, well, what has changed? So, I mean, I could have done it with more years, but I think this gives you a, a better indication of what's going on. So here we have a considerable decline in mace contribution, and we have an increase in sugars, a decrease in wheat, a decrease in milk, a decrease in pork, but a considerable increase in chicken. I mean, it's poultry, but it's mostly chicken, uh, which is why I call chicken the neoliberal meat. And another major increase is soybean oil and a decline in beans. So, I mean, that definitely has to do with the declining uh, ingestion of proteins coming from vegetable products. Uh, and uh, it is not coincidental that these two have increased because, you know, two of the major products that have increased from agriculture are corn and soybeans. Both are either, you know, to produce soybean oil or to produce poultry because, I mean, poultry is transmuted forms of corn. Uh, more specifically, about two pounds of corn is what it takes to produce one pound of chicken. It takes about six pounds to produce one pound of beef, which is why chicken is a lot more accessible. And that's why it's become the neoliberal meat. So um, this is the share of household income spent on food, you know, so from all the family's budget, how much do they spend on food? And what I did here, see, uh, the Instituto Nacional de Estadística, Geografía e Informática, or the National Institute for uh, Statistics, uh, Geography and Informatics, they present the data in 10 chunks of 10% each from the income spectrum, you know, from the poorest to the wealthiest. So what I did is that I reorganized that data so that we would have a better picture of inequality with the poorest 10% on one end, the richest 10% on the other end, and then the intermediary 
40% uh, chunk here, the poorest or the medium poor, and I'm calling the other one the medium rich, uh, 51 to 90%. So something that's interesting from a development point of view here is that uh, in all cases, even for the rich, families are spending a larger share of their budget on food. That's not supposed to happen. I mean, in, in the broad spectrum of human history, food prices have been declining for about half a millennium. Um, so, this trend is definitely not good. It's associated with neoliberalism and inequality. So um, both interstate and class inequality. So what I do in the next two charts is to give you one example of the top five luxury food expenditures and uh, well, I mean, th these are just the top five uh, luxury food expenditures. And what I did here is I equated the absolute numbers of expenditures by the richest uh, decile, the richest 10% into 100. And then the question was, what do the other income groups spend in relation to that 100%? And so obviously in most of these food groups, uh, the other income groups spent considerably less. So these are the medium rich, these are the medium poor, and these are the 10% poorest, okay? And the same goes uh, for other products. Now, why do I call these the top five luxury food expenditures? Well, I made a more or less arbitrary, but I guess a logical decision. Uh, it was all those products where the poorest 10% could not afford to spend even 50% as much as the rich decile did, all right? So in some cases, you know, for the other groups, they spent 74, 75, et cetera. Uh, but I mean, you know, fish, you could say, is the most luxury food given that all the income groups here are spending less than what the wealthiest 10% uh, spend. And uh, conversely, milk may be the more accessible of the luxury foods. Alcoholic beverages, second, vegetables, beef, etc. Let's go to the top five basic foods. And here, to me, what's really mesmerizing is the fact that with regard to tortillas, all the other income groups, except for the wealthiest, spend more, you know, larger quantities of absolute dollars or pesos in tortillas. And a similar thing happens I mean, well, you know, they, not as much, but uh, I guess one criterion to include these particular foods in this group was that all of the income groups, except for the rich, spent above 50% of their, uh, of what the rich decile was spending, right? I mean, all the figures that we have here for the income groups are above 50%. And uh, as you can see here, this is kind of interesting that uh, as far as sugars go, the poor spend, you know, a larger amount than the medium poor. And the same goes for tubers, the same goes for beans. You know, they spend more than the medium poor in, in those categories. So conclusions. The middle, upper, and upper classes, they are eating more meat, fruit and vegetables, and wine. And why I put that uh, in parentheses? Well, because I don't present data on that, and I'm just doing some exploratory analysis on that. Um, and the lower and middle income classes, they 
eat more energy dense foods and beer. So I would call beer the neoliberal alcoholic beverage and wine would be the luxury. Or maybe I guess I, I should rephrase that. Beer is the basic alcoholic beverage. Wine is the luxury alcoholic beverage. And I should qualify that that depends on the country that we're talking about. Because if you talk about France, Spain, or Italy, wine is definitely also a basic drink there. So um, ultimately, it's more about structure, not choice, that matters. And that's it. All right, thank you. Um, so I guess to make it easier, could you unshare your screen? And uh, um, we will try to just, uh, to do, we can either do the chat or you can type in the chat or raise your hand or get my attention and then I will. Okay, Chaya has a question for you. Hello, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering if when you were showing those charts, if you were including supplemental nutrition programs in the money spent on those foods. Uh, yes, uh, the calculation is made on total, uh, total income. So it would include, things, so it would include like WIC dollars or SNAP dollars. Yeah. I mean, we don't have those programs in Mexico, but. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking because in the US, for things like dairy and beans and vegetables, a lot of our supplemental nutrition programs that are government funded would pay for those. So, therefore, the food dollars coming out of people's pockets would be spent more on the processed other type foods because the, those are the things that are not as, as supplemented. Um, yeah, so but all of that is taken into account as part of the family's budget. Right. Uh, I mean, all the income su supplements are added to household budgets. And so the question becomes, you know, from this total household budget, how much is being spent on food and many other things? I mean, I only focused on food. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, also calculates that in the same way, you know, total income after taxes and after supplemental income. Good question. We have more questions, hopefully. <clears throat> you can also ask questions from the book, I assume, that wasn't talk covered oh, in your- absolutely, yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, don't be shy. You can also, uh, I mean, I would welcome critiques of the book if, if you have any things that, uh, you would have liked to see and didn't. Gracias, me encantó el libro, mucho. Um, I, my question is related to something we discussed in class last week. Um, actually, I actually have three questions. So I'll just ask one and wait for somebody else and then ask another one. <laughs> I was wondering, um, this one, I want to talk about some. I have a lot of friends who are involved in fat pride movement and fat liberation and the work. Which, which movement? Fat, fat, pride, oh, fat pride and, right, and right. fat liberation. Mm -hmm. And most of them that I know that are involved in that um, do have a similar critique that you do of society that there are serious structural, patriarchal, and often medical industrial complex issues that have influenced not only what they consume, but also how they are viewed by society and are challenging that. And as you were saying in a book, you know, if you see these shifts on a macro level in consumption, you know it's not individuals saying, I'll eat more sugar today and every day. But when you see that type of stratification and large numbers of groups. I'm just quoting that because it's very moving to me. Um, then we can see the structural change and issues. And so I was wondering how, um, from your vantage point and looking at, at movements like Fat Pride and Fat Lib, which challenge fat phobia, um, 
yeah, what has what has produced that in your in your like kind of framework? How 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 do you process that? And what do you think it might? What insights does that bring? And does your framework bring bring to those conversations? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a, a very important uh, perspective uh, because, unfortunately, you know, this uh, new liberal diet is uh, generating new roots of inequality and new roots for discrimination. And I mean, all of these happen more at the micro level of social interaction. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a really sad example of France, which I may mention in the book, I can't remember, uh, about how, you know, for the state to try to deal with child obesity, they encouraged, they, they encouraged people to shame kids for being fat. I mean, I think that that's just mind boy. It, it's tragic, right? Because it's obviously not their fault. Uh, I mean, who can be less at fault than children who probably don't even decide, you know, what, what's in their lunchbox, right? Uh, so now the, the treatment I've seen, and uh, for instance, in Julie Guthman, uh, I don't know if, if you guys uh, read uh, Julie Guzman's uh, book. It's, it's a really good book in, in many things. But in my perspective, or in my view, I think she pays a little too much attention to the uh, constructionist perspective uh, in the sense that uh, I think it's, I mean, they, they bring up really important points, but they cannot be resolved unless the inequality issues are addressed. Uh, so, I mean, that, that would be my, my response. I mean, it, it's really tragic. I think, you know, we need to be more educated uh, about uh, how overweight and obesity are, for the most part, beyond people's choices. But we need to understand then, you know, how to nudge a societal actor like the state to modify the structures of inequality and to modify the food system, which is really, really controlled by agribusiness multinationals that enjoy these subsidies for corn and soybeans. I mean, we wouldn't be eating as much meat as we do if corn and soybeans were not as heavily subsidized in the United States. I think that's a great point that people that connection is missed i don't think people many people see the subsidy the subsidy programs um connection to increased meat consumption but anyway i won't talk go ahead anna hi thank you so much for that i Loved listening to someone explain the charts as I looked at them too, to just better understand what I was looking at. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of times there, um, I see authors that will talk about how there is a lot of um, structural influence for the diets that we have, but kind of revert back to um, giving suggestions on an individual level because that's where they see like agency for their reader perhaps like giving a suggestion as to what like the reader um can do and that is why even if they are discussing these structural um components they include that part um so i'm curious as to who you would consider like your audience for this book or um what yeah who do you hope would be reading this and for what purpose would they be reading this? Uh, well, I guess the, my ideal audience would be people who are trying to mobilize uh, against inequality and uh, against the existing food system. So, because I think it's only, uh, I mean, unlike, you know, the mainstream books on, on food and nutrition, which assume that agency is individual, my assumption is that 
agency can only be collective. And so only social movements are able to nudge the state in a different direction. I mean, even things that on the face of it, you know, they're, they're pretty positive developments like, uh, let's say, uh, food labeling, you know, the, the labels that tell you whether uh, there is a lot of fat or sugar or salt or uh, transgenics. Uh, it's fine, but it, I mean, it, that's for people, for the privileged people, perhaps like yourself. I mean, maybe you can make better choices, uh, but a very large majority of the population can't. And I mean, it's, there are studies that uh, have indicated that even with better education, people are still not able to make better food choices because they can't afford them. So unless we tackle inequality or you know, what choices are being offered to us in the food system, things are not gonna change very much. After Mel, I'll go again. Um, I, I had a question about um, you kind of identifying that the food prices are actually increasing, which is not really a good sign. And um, I guess like, as I think about, um, more just systems where workers are getting compensated appropriately and uh, agricultural processes are ecologically respectful, that the natural effect of that would be higher prices for food. So I guess I, I, I struggled to, to, think, to think that through and how, how food can be more affordable without at the same time making it better for all actors involved like how does it how does how is it possible to be cheaper or yeah i guess i just get stuck on that idea mm -hmm. okay uh i'm not sure if, if i fully understood your question but uh i mean the reason why there is an expectation that food prices are going to decline uh, has to do with the political economy of capitalism. Why is that? Because uh, wages, if you think about wages, one of the main components of wages, uh, okay, more generally, I mean, theoret the theoretical wage is supposed to be enough to reproduce the worker and his or her family, right? And a very important component of, of the cost of reproduction of labor power is food. And I mean, if you compare the United States, the average expenditure in food is around 15%, but in Mexico, it's a, around 35%. Because there's a huge difference there. Uh, and that's before, you know, we split into income groups and so on and so forth. But, you know, from the point of view of the capitalists, the less the worker has to spend on food, the lower the wages they have to pay. And so the, the lower the wages have to be, the more is left for profits. So, I mean, that's one reason why agriculture has played such an essential role in capitalist development, because it, it lowers the cost of labor power. And therefore it increases Profitability for capital. I, I don't know if that's more or less what you were asking, or I went into a totally different direction. Let me know. You can rephrase. No, I mean I think I. Yeah, if you increase the wages, then they, then populations will be better able to afford higher prices of food. So it would just. You need to. Yeah stimulate the, the popula population's wealth in order to uh, increase the price of the food and make it there for them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, you know, this is not a static situation, right? I mean, it's all a product of, uh, and that maybe I'm gonna sound really cliche here, but it's all a product of class struggle. 
So there may be times when uh, workers really get organized and they are able to improve their wages, improve their uh, food quality consumption and so on and so forth. But since the 1980s uh, with uh, you know, Reagan, uh, the Reagan administration, one of the main things it tried to do was to uh, weaken labor organization, weaken unions. And by now, you know, the rates of unionization in the United States are uh, rock bottom. And we've seen what happened last week with uh, the Amazon workers. You know, the, Amazon uh, did a, a really concerted campaign against unionization. And that, that's pretty tragic because, I mean, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, Joe Biden was supporting the unionization drive, you know, these behemoths of the company managed to impede it. So, but I mean, if that eventually becomes successful, those workers are going to be able to uh, not just, you know, be able to afford better food, but also to improve their working conditions. Sarah, go for it. Okay. I really appreciate what you're bringing with this class critique. Um, it reminds me of some of the work of the Poor People's Campaign um, because many of us have been educated with and live with this myth that class doesn't exist in the US. So thank you for busting through that on so many levels. Um, as I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Uh, but on 174, my question is, was it really necessary to say that class trumps gender and racial ethnic inequality? I mean, just wondering, like why both the use of the language of the verb when we know who was president, you know, at that time, or was that what you were trying to do? Or like, why, why not? I guess what, so like, what, yeah, why? Why does it have to trump? Like, as a black feminist, I see interlocking systems of oppression and they mutually reinforce one another. And I don't see a one point of origin, for example, with the exception of potentially the doctrine of discovery in 1455, which was a Christian hegemonic move. So I might, I'm the religion major, so I might locate it around that kind of time, but that religion, that religious document had to do with the development of capital and the devaluing of Arab and black folks right at its heart. So we can argue, we can have a conversation about origins, but also- What was the date that you mentioned? That's a 1455 papal bull document. It's, it's, it's what Columbus sails on. It's the, okay. those document sets. Um, but yeah, I guess the, other, the, part of the part of the question is like, what kind, you said there isn't data that supports kind of this, this other question of how race, gender, and I would frankly say indigeneity versus settler culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, what kind of data do you need to see to, to believe that like, both because we have data on medical medical racism that regardless of class, black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women, regardless of class. We have data around environmental racism, regardless of, uh, of income levels, black and other people of colors communities are more likely to have toxic sites. Right, so this is, has history of housing segregation, et cetera, which is not class-based, race-based, but they're not unconnected in terms of how they were written. So, so what, and then feminists have given us this great gift of, of the intra-household dynamics. That's so when we calculate household budget, we don't necessarily know what's happening. Of course, they're not all heterosexual households and stuff, but, um, and then you mentioned that Amazon, a lot of these essential workers are mostly black and brown. So why, why I guess, why not um, bring it all to, to get together um, or 